Well, um, welcome to the first webinar in the Dental Fusion Webinars Management uh, Monday series, and in fact, to the first Dental Fusion webinar. My name is Derek Watson. Uh, what I'm going to do is really run through a bit about the um, forerunner of the Dental Fusion Organization, which is the Dental Professionals Association, and then um, just take you through the ideas and perhaps the thinking behind this association, because I think uh, in many ways, it's the thinking behind it which is the most exciting thing about it. So, off we go. Um, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of the history of the Dental Practitioners Association. Uh, it was obviously formerly was the General Dental Practitioners Association. It was formed in, uh, its first meeting was on the 9th of November 1953, which means it's just past its 69th birthday. It wasn't actually formed until 1954. It was set up really against the background of the creation of the National Health Service and the um, perceived deterioration in the terms and conditions of the dentists at the time. The NHS dentists weren't happy to be represented by the British Dental Association, which they thought was uh, an association of consultants and uh, academics. So they started their own association, which was uh, dedicated to the, those of them that were working in sort of what we call a high street practice now or family dentist, what used to be called general dental practice. So it is and always was an unincorporated association and for a long time was a trade union um, with the officers elected in accordance with the trade union legislation. That meant that uh, they had to be elected directly by the members. And it was governed by an elected council which was also uh, elected by the members every three years. It was based for a long time in Colchester, the offices of Michael Watson and then Barnsley and then moved to Harley Street but then uh, around about uh, the middle of last year we decided we didn't really need uh, premises because most of what we were doing was computer based and uh, traveling in and out of central London was becoming a bit of a pain so uh, the Harley Street offices was closed and uh, and the DPA uh, vanished into the cloud. One of the things that we did in the two years prior to that was open up the membership of the association to all dental care professionals and that including nurses, hygienists etc and of course it was against the background of registration of all DCPs with the General Dental Council and at that time we renamed the association the Dental Professionals Association and then uh, towards the end of last year we decided that uh, trade union uh, registration was was costing a lot of money it meant it added five thousand pounds a year to accounting etc etc uh, and wasn't really bringing in much in the way of benefits and so um, the DPA ceased to become a trade union so there's a little bit more on there with it there's a Wikipedia reference anyway if you're uh, mad enough to be uh, interested in the history of the association so what's really happened in the last year uh, it started off in January with a meeting of the DPA council voting for a merger with GDPA Limited, which was uh, obviously a, an incorporated company, subsidiary of Code. Then in 15th of February, uh, in pursuit of that merger, the management of the DPA was given to GDPA Limited. I have to declare an interest as the chief executive, former chief executive of the DPA. I was then dismissed on the 21st of March. Neville, who's pictured there, was quite prominent in the campaign against the uh, merger with, with Code Stroke GDPA Limited. He resigned on the 21st of January on a point of principle that he didn't agree with it, so he resigned and, and, and subsequently called a special general meeting of the members, which was in core rate, but it had the sort of uh, the desired result, which was that the, the council of the association, I think, came to the realization that the merger was not going to be popular. In the meantime, Code had done their own survey of the members and they found that roughly two-thirds of the members didn't want to merge. And so what happened was the, the chairman at the, uh, at the January meeting, chairman at the time, Reg Short, then resigned at the end of May, um, closely followed by the council, which left the association obviously a bit rudderless. So Neville carried on working quite hard on this and uh, in, on the 4th of September, the chairman, Brian Levy, appointed Neville as the caretaker chairman with a view to sort of trying to do something with the association and seeing what could be done. So there was, and there still is a demand for an alternative association to the British Dental Association and it's summed up by this posting on the GDP UK discussion group which wasn't posted by, by me by the way. People are sort of quite actively 
feel that they're disenfranchised and they want to uh, perhaps uh, an association which is a bit more proactive but the problem with the dpa was that it had, it had no management no invoices were being collected no subscriptions were being paid um, no magazines were getting printed so how do you rebuild an association from the ground up well this is the sort of association that we didn't want as soon as three dentists get together they form an association uh, one gets elected as the chairman, the other one gets elected as the secretary, and the third one gets elected as the treasurer. And then they all try to avoid doing anything apart from claiming their expenses. So that was the model that had, we tried and failed, and uh, so, so that's exactly what we didn't want to do. So as John Humphreys said on the BBC Today programme this morning, you never waste a good crisis. Uh, and we had a good crisis, so this is what we started with, sheet of blank paper. And this is what we came up with. Now, this is, um, I do apologise if you can't read this uh, all that brilliantly. It was, this is not the original sketch of the original idea. This was done by someone after I explained to him the idea of keeping the members central and surrounding them with all the customary suppliers to primary dental care. And that's really how it started off the relationship with suppliers was tricky. The DPA had tried every possible way of working with commercial firms. Uh, we tried commission, we tried discount, we tried rebate, um, none of them worked. They all relied on the uh, quarterly meetings and the suppliers declaring how many members had joined their association and us chasing them up for commission or, or rebate and stuff like that. So we knew really um, what didn't work. Here you can see the association as uh, the the uh, members in the association and uh, and a series of what we call core services and the core services are the ones that in general tend to be not very profitable they tend to be the ones like lobbying parliament and uh, keeping an eye on dental policy but, and they were very important to us but um, we had this big problem of how to um, pay for them Let's move on to the next, uh, this is looking a bit more form now, it's starting to come together. And we decided to use what we call a freemium model. Now, a freemium model involves, it's very common on the internet, involves giving away some value and then charging for a more extensive service. For example, a lawyer might give away a free pro forma staff contract and then charge for a partnership contract or charge for the work involved in a practice sale. It gives suppliers exposure to the dental market as an affiliate of the association, which in affiliate marketing is, is very in these days, and a chance to showcase their products or services. And it also builds up a relationship between the suppliers and the market. It gives the DFO members added value, free of charge, and the range of suppliers in the dental sector that are tried and tested. So this is, again, is still an early version, but you can see it's been tidied up by now, and it clearly shows the overlap between the suppliers and the members, the freemium services, and the overlap between the suppliers, where, for example, a solicitor might be working with an accountant on a practice sale or a purchase. Uh, and it also shows where the logo came from, the, the concept of the members in the middle with the, the supplier sort of circling around them. The day-to-day -day management of the association, incidentally, is also subcontracted by the members in this way, meaning that the members don't have to manage or employ staff. The suppliers work on fixed-term contracts, which are renewable at three years or five years at the discretion of the members, depending on whether they've done a good job or not. So what are the core principles on which the association has been built? Well, it remains a mutual independent, not-for-profit association. And in that way, providing the income is spent on member benefits, it avoids corporation tax. Unlike uh, companies, other companies like Code, which are incorporated with shareholders, it also avoids VAT. 10% of the member spending is recycled, um, which gives uh, real meaning to the idea of mutuality. Now, what I'm going to try and do is demonstrate that for you by going to the, uh, the Fusion website. And uh, this is the, uh, the new idea. Now, I think the first thing you can see from that is very much more like a, a sort of a, 
a buying website, which you'd expect a commercial organization to have. And so that's the first thing that's a bit unusual is that uh, we've got practice membership here um, and it's there as something that they can purchase or uh, associate membership is something there that they can purchase. But anything that's bought on this website uh, will give the, the purchaser 10% of the value back as reward points. So for example, if someone buying a practice membership will get a, a roughly £18.37 to spend on something else. And that's all handled by the web. So we've covered the uh, mutuality. The next big thing is that there's, there's going to be no council. The council which caused the problem in effect is history. The members will be the governing body. With the internet, there's no reason why members can't be consulted on major issues. And so we are going to ask the members if any important decisions come up, what uh, they would like to do. And they will vote by um, internet, online voting. Those who don't have access or don't want to vote online will vote by post. Uh, I've already mentioned the freemium model. What I haven't mentioned is that it's likely to deliver over a thousand pounds worth of benefits to a typical practice owner. And we're building on that all the time. And the other thing is that the DFO, DPA, new DFO will be a campaigning organization. And that came out strongly in our surveys that people wanted the magazine. They wanted the private fees and wages guide. And they wanted us to keep a check and balance on the government, the British Dental Association and various other organizations such as the General Dental Council and the um, Care Quality Commission, etc. So we'll also be retaining our unique benefits which are a helpline staffed by dentally qualified personnel, our subsidized indemnity product, Dental Shield, one of the only two associate contracts approved by HMRC to uh, maintain the self-employed status of associates, and the industry standard private fees and wages guide. And we'll also be running not one, but several series of training webinars all of these are timed to last about half an hour, starting at 1.15 to coincide with people's lunch hours. Um, and we have a, an impressive lineup of speakers. All the webinars are free and open to anyone, but uh, DFO members will get priority in the event of overbooking. And of course, they will get verifiable CPD from the association. Well, I hope that's been useful and convenient for you. It certainly has for me. No more traveling, no more rooms to book, no more hotels to pay for. My contact details are on the screen if anyone would like to get in touch. So thanks for your time and attention.